Hello, everyone, and welcome to a rollicking new episode of the Studio Me cast. We are coming to you from Studio Me's Speakeasy, which if you want to start your own podcast, you can rent out this wonderful space for yourself. You can check that out in the link in the description below. And as always, I am joined by a special guest. This is Rick Dutro, actor, director. You may have heard about him before on a previous episode when we had Stephanie Swift on, and she talked about her husband, Rick, and... We made our promise come true. Here he is joining <laughs> us in the Speakeasy. Rick, thank you for joining me today. Peter, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. you have uh, I've known you for a while, mm-hmm. and uh, mostly, though, through your performances, I'd say. Just seeing you on the screen at a lot of the <laughs> independent film festivals here in Pittsburgh, whether it's the Oaks Festival, the 48-Hour Film Project, the Horror Sci-Fi 48... Um, and uh, a few others. I believe you were nominated for a film that was at the Indie Gathering as well. I believe so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've been to that one too. So it's, uh, but it's wonderful to have you here Thank today. You. Um, I want to just start off with, uh, as an actor, when did you first get the bite from the bug? When did you first get? interested how did this begin for you wow Uh, that's that's a great question um very early in my life i I would say probably when i was maybe three four five years of age and how that came about for me was um i i grew up in a pretty poor household to be honest and uh um, my father drank a lot was an alcoholic and uh, w- when I was young, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with, with my dad. But when I did, he would take me to the movies. So a trip to the movie theater for me as a small child was like like Christmas morning for me. Because I, w- I got to spend time with my dad. But I didn't get to see a lot of. And I got to spend it in a theater immersed in magic especially for a young child. And uh, we, we saw all kinds of different films, but uh, from an early age, I discovered that what was happening in the theater and on the screen was so much different than the life that I lived at home. And it was literally like taking a trip to Magic Land and getting out of, you know, what was my home life into something that was dramatically different than home in, in a super positive way. And, and it's at some point, as a, as a young person, I, I decided that, and I guess it was around the time I understood that, that what I saw up on the screen wasn't real, that it was being literally depicted, manufactured for the audience. And when I realized that people were doing that literally for me, for the audience, I somehow wanted to give that back to people because I appreciated it so greatly. So at some point, very young, I decided I wanted to do that. I wanted to be able to make people sit down and watch me and be drawn out of their life, circumstances, whatever it was, and hopefully into a positive experience that that really would change their their mood their attitude and and their day and maybe make them forget about the bad things or the negative things or the not so happy things that 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 we all experience at some degree in our life it's a tremendous honor to be able to entertain do you it's a blessing mm -hmm. do you uh remember when you went to the movies with your dad did you pick the movie or did your dad pick the movie how did that go Ooh, um a, a lot of times it would happen that my dad and my uncle would take my cousin and my myself we were both the same age and we both uh, my uncle was in the navy and when he got out of the navy in california he came back to pennsylvania and they ended up buying a house literally one block from my house where I 
my mom and dad lived. And and that was about when we were, we were three years old, uh, both he and I, Steve and, and me. And uh, quite frequently we would go to the movies together uh, as, you know, my uncle and my dad taking us. Um, I side, I've sidetracked myself and <laughs> went past your question. Uh, it was uh, who picked what movie? Oh, I, I don't. I guess my, what I was trying to say was I don't remember exactly who picked the movies, um, but I think it was a collaboration between my dad and my uncle. I, I think most of them had to be something that my dad and uncle would sit through, and, and <laughs> something that would be appropriate for for young kids. Um, a lot of it was Disney related movies. Um, um, I, I remember a lot of cartoons. I'm sure it, it may have developed from the promos where you, you watch the promos for the, the coming movies and we would get excited about certain movies and probably that would influence, I would think, the adults to pick the one that the kids are. It's Rick, Ricky and Steve. Ricky and Stevie were so excited to see. Now, that's how you got the initial bite from the bug, as we say. Um, what was your first experience acting? Was it on stage or on screen? Where would you put that? That's another good question. Um, my, my dad was famous for every holiday getting out the 8mm uh, camera, Super 8, and no sound, but you know, he'd hold it up and f film all the birthdays. I, uh, I was the oldest of three, and then my sister was two years behind me, and then my, my, my brother, the youngest, seven years behind me, but my dad would film all the Christmases, us walking down the steps in our pajamas. We weren't allowed downstairs until dad had the camera up and ready to go, you know, and Back then, they had the light bar with the two big light bulbs at the end. I mean, you're too young to probably even remember that. And then it was a little Super 8 camera in between. And, and we would walk down the steps, and, you know, there would be the Christmas tree and all the presents, and we would, you know, open them and display them. And uh, So I, my point for t telling you that was I would see myself in those movies all the time, mm. home movies. Mm, mm hmm so I think that kind of got it in my head when I would see my dad's home movies and then go to the theater and see the professional films that I, I might have, in my mind, it's probably definitely in my subconscious mind, connected those two as threads leading me in a direction that would be, uh, besides home movies, mm -hmm. which would be, be the first thing I believe I would perform because I would ham it up for my dad. <laughs> I was always uh, comfortable to do that. Um, but but the first thing I was ever cast in and the first thing I really ever acted in was I it was it was school school related. Um, I believe it was in the second grade. I had a homeroom teacher, Mrs. Vicini. And Mrs. Vicini, in her graduate program um, in grad school, had written a musical uh, to be performed by children uh, because I, she may have been in education or something like that related. She was my teacher, so I'm assuming that. And it was a, it was a musical. Um, and, and the big I remember the big uh, number, musical number, was to the tune of... Um, Raindrops keep falling on my head. Mm. But the premise for the play, the musical, was it took place in a garden, and we were all walking and talking vegetables. <laughs> and, and Mrs. Vicini, for some reason, cast me as the king of the garden. I was the King Pumpkin, and I had a pumpkin head that I wore. Nice. <laughs> and all the kids were different vegetables, and there were different musical numbers. And I remember her getting involved at some point whoops in coming out and joining us for one of the numbers and you know it was performed 
uh, I, I believe we did three performances. There were three classrooms in that school, that element, second grade elementary school. And uh, I believe we did a show for each of the classrooms, parents and kids. So I think I did two of the three. And uh, the one I, for some reason, I think I was sick, I believe. Hmm. And uh, one of the other boys had to stand in and step up and do my part. But yeah, second grade, second grade musical. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. So uh, now that's... Uh, a lot of your origin and past and like, but now let's, let's jump to today with this. What is, when, when it comes to acting, it could be on screen or on a stage or whatever, mm-hmm. whether it's rehearsal or breaking down the script or edit, what is your favorite part of all of it? Like, is there, do you have a favorite moment during a production and a, do you have a favorite type of production? I, I think my favorite part of anything that I would do is the end, end result because quite honestly everything up to that point is a lot of work and some of that work is joyous some of it's laborious and even even for an actor performer but um, I my favorite is when it's all done and I get to watch it and I actually like it Mm, mm-hmm. Where I, where I'm content with what I did, because I, I may be my harshest critic, potentially, that most things I see, I, oh man, why did I do that? Why, why did my inflection go there instead of here? Why did I look in that direction, or why is my was my chin down, or I didn't have enough emotion behind that or too much emotion behind that. I wasn't subtle enough there when I should have been. You know, all those different things. And why did I say that word like that? Why did I emphasize this syllable instead of that? And, you know, I'll, I'll critique it all like that. Um, I try to do all that homework ahead of time so that when I do sit down and watch what I did in the past at that moment, that... I'm like, ah, I can live with that. And then I'll maybe smile a little bit inside and be happy. But, yeah, it's, that's that's hard to achieve for me. There's the famous saying that a lot ends up on the cutting room floor. Have you ever seen... Ended up on the cutting room well, floor? Well, not, not that. <laughs> like, I mean, that happens to everybody, yeah, right? I, but... I have um, a good story about you that. You can too. change a lot in a performance through the editing. Have you well, seen um, a performance, like a performance that you did? Have you ever seen, uh, I guess, been surprised by the way that maybe the in- the intention of the character might have been changed through editing? Have you experienced that? Well, well I'll say about editing, I, I think. All the facets of a film are important. If you have a weak facet, it dramatically affects your film, I I believe, and certain facets more so than others. Certain facets are very visible, and other facets may be not so visible by where they're situated in the facet we call the movie as a whole. Um, But the... Of all the facets, I think the editor is the most important, absolutely the most important. The editor makes the film. Now, we can say that in, in film, on stage, it's, it's a whole different dynamic. But the editor in film is, I, I think, the most important. And, and I think I even heard um, Trying to think, I'm really bad with names, so you'll see that as we go. Um, But uh, a Pittsburgh actress uh, played in Fargo. Oh, yeah, Frances Frances, McDermott. Frances Mm -hmm. McDermott. I heard her recently talk about the editor too, and say the same thing, and 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 say that she, as an as an actress, loves it when she knows who the editor is, Mm -hmm. and, and and knows that the editor 
has had a lot of communication with the director because it's really the, if the director knows the editor and they've discussed what they want from the film and how it will be created and, and edited, then everything f should flow in that direction. And the, the director becomes a person to direct, knowing the rhythm and the 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 uh, the choices that the editor is already going to make, and it makes for stronger performances from the actor, and makes stronger performance for, from the director, because the editor gives the end result. You know, he he controls the shredder. <laughs> mm -hmm. what what's gets shredded and how and and what's what doesn't get you know what makes it so i think yeah the editor controls so much from the pace to when a scene is cut you know which can mean a lot for an actor because there's there's not, nothing worse i think for an actor is when when i i'm watching a film that 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 i did and i'm in and and literally the edit happens at a point where, why? Like, it just didn't, the phrase that I just spoke maybe cuts away and misses a reaction mm -hmm. that would have been crucial to just the the subtext to the scene and to, to, to my character. Um, it, it, it maybe cuts to a reaction of a scene partner that that scene partner's reaction isn't really important to s telling the story as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so if the editor, I guess if the editor isn't really in sync with the rest of the um, film, it can it can it can just hit some sour notes, mm -hmm. some flat notes, or some sharp notes when you do, when you want to hit pitch. If, if that makes. Any sense? I don't know if I explained what was in my head or not. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. But I think the editor is very important. Mm -hmm. the The editor becomes literally like the the conductor, even though we think the director may be the conductor. The director is a co conductor, mm -hmm. but it's really the the supreme choice is in the hand of the editor, he or she. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you spend <laughs> all kind of time and work on a scene uh, and you think, ah, oh, this is fantastic stuff or however you feel about it, if the editor cuts it out of there, like it can just be, it can just, pff, no one will ever see it, right. you know? And like maybe the That's director... That's when the director needs to know to say, hey, let's yeah. pick up the pace in this scene because mm -hmm. we're, it's, we're not going to add that many seconds to this bit. Mm -hmm. I always like working with an editor that has... Um, a good intuition and similar sensibilities. There was uh, one uh, editor who's actually have been interviewed a couple times on this show, Simon Barracini, who um, and he is a filmmaker in his own right as well. But uh, he and I worked on a couple projects, and I think Stephanie's worked with Simon, I believe. Oh, I, probably, I yeah. Believe. But he had this ability where you shoot a scene, and I was picking out like, okay, I know what the best takes are here. Like, this is how this should go. And, um, he'd make a cut of it before sitting down with me, just like, Hey, get the editor's cut. Maybe they saw something I didn't, you know? Right. Um, or sometimes it was a timing thing. <laughs> right. And, uh, but then, yeah, being there and being able to see like that he hit all of the beats and that's really awesome to see that. And it helps, me know that I'm doing my job, <laughs> you know, that like, oh, the things I'm trying to get across someone else saw. Um, and it's great to know like, oh, that moment with the actor where they took their time before they gave the line that turns the scene really hits, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's like we're all discovering the same film in a cool way. So well, it's um, good when everybody's got that same vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know, absolutely. They're on the same frequency. Yeah, it's uh, communication is very important. Exactly, it's not easy to get everyone on the same frequency unless you communicate through through the whole mm -hmm. pre production and post production process. Right. It's early on in this show, um, 
like early episodes, I would ask people about, you know, some things that like would, you know, could go wrong or whatever. And I eventually kind of stopped asking that question because the answer was always the same, which was like the worst stuff happens because of communication issues. Um, and I mean, like barring safety concerns, right. You know, stuff like that, you know, it's like, you don't want to, but like, um, most of the issues that are going to happen are through communication. That's been my experience too. But, um, all right. So moving, moving right along here, you've, uh, spent some time on stage and on screen. Do you have a preference for either one of those? There's more money to be to be made in film and TV than stage. Um, but boy, do you learn so much more in stage work as for an actor, mm-hmm. because there's so much more rehearsal time. Uh, most um, independent films, and even when I worked on American Rust, which was a big budget production, there's there's very little rehearsal. I mean. When the rehearsals basically start when the director says action. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you have three takes or four takes or or 50 takes, that's your rehearsal period. Um, and I, I, I personally like to be prepared before the word action. So that's nice. That's what's nice about the stage is for an actor you have a rehearsal period. And you have hours and hours and hours of rehearsal. That that as an actor, I don't, I, I don't get that. That rehearsal time. In film or TV, because I have to do it outside, of. My day on the set, you know, you have to prepare in advance. Well, you you can only prepare so much in advance. You're not really with. If you have a scene partner or multiple scene partners, they're not with you at home or in your little studio wherever you go mm-hmm. to rehearse. They're not with you um, unless there's a budget in that production that pays actors to show up for rehearsal. And now, very few do. For a stage production, have you ever worked with an actor who didn't like to rehearse? Um. You don't have to name names, by the way. Whenever uh, I ask you a question about an experience, I'm not like, who was it? You know, I mean, in general, uh, it, I, I've been part of theatrical productions on many different kind of levels. But all those levels, uh, you're, you typically sign a contract, and in that contract you have to be at the called rehearsals. So an actor to say, I don't want to rehearse or I don't like to rehearse, um, I would say that would be something I would think would be more of an actor that you would s- maybe run into from that does just basically film. Mm-hmm. Their background is film, their education is film, and their experience is film. But if you come up in the stage on the stage like I did from you know an early age, I, I had my first professional stage performance at, at age 17 um, and was involved in the stage many times, you know, many times for many years prior to that. Um, but yeah, you're, as a stage actor, re- rehearsal's part of what you sign up for. Uh, and film, not necessarily. Mm. It's, it's rare that you have rehearsal. But you definitely prefer it. Well, it depends. Uh, um, I I enjoy film because it's it's lasting. Stage I pref- I uh, prefer for me working my craft because through the rehearsal process I get to work on the things that I need to work on as an actor um, to make my performance the best it it can be. Um, sometimes on screen it's it's hit or miss because did i prepare properly for that scene well i sometimes don't know until i get there and peter says rick action and i run a scene and you would say ah, rick um 
I see where you're going with that, but here's where I want you to go. And it can go in a whole different, you could take me in a whole different direction. And that may be the best direction to go. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't prepared. You know, my head wasn't prepared. So now I have to change gears and rework my character for that, for the moment that you set up versus maybe the moment that I rehearsed at home for. Or in my trailer before, you know, wherever the rehearsal takes place. So there's the dynamics vastly different between a acting for the camera and acting for the stage. Um, they're both exciting. They're both rewarding. Um, stage is immediate reaction and input from your audience, mm -hmm. where film is a delayed response from your audience although sometimes the set on set if you really nail a scene the crew will mm -hmm. you know they'll clap mm -hmm. afterwards i've been lucky enough to have that happen at different times so there is a reward on set but it's the real reward is when the audience sits down and in the theater and, and watches your performance so I guess the reward for an actor is is truly in the in the theater, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's and the reward is given by the audience members who react to what what they see you do. If you're playing a good guy, they cheer for you. If you're playing the bad guy, they'll make all kinds of sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when you're um, when you when you're starting a role. All right, let's say it's a role you're not familiar with. It's not like uh, from a play you've been in before or anything like that. That's and, exciting. Yeah, and you're starting with the script, right? When you are going through the script, what's your process for that? Do you write on the script? Do you, are you looking for anything in particular? How do you get started with a character? Well, the first thing I like to do is read it as an audience member. Read it as somebody who's not the actor, or just just read it for the enjoyment of the of the the book. Mm. Um, and then after I read it, if if I know what part I'm aiming for or have been cast as, you know, if, if it's an audition, I may be auditioning for two characters in a in a script, maybe three, depending on the the, the play or the the screenplay. But uh, after I have read it, as, just generally read it as uh, anyone would read it for enjoyment to see if I like it, um, then I'll focus on the character, and, and then I'll read it with, with the character in mind, specifically focusing as an actor paying attention to this character that I'm going to literally get intimate with in, you know, in an emotional way. And and then I'll start uh, I'll start with that reading that focused reading I'll start taking notes and it could be a, it could be everything from what words I'd stress in a sentence or what do you write your notes on the script pages themselves or do you have a separate notebook for I'll, I'll typically in, in, I'll typically be ha reading a copy that I can mark up. Mm. Mm -hmm. So if you ever look at my scripts, uh, you'll see I have you know, all kinds of things mm -hmm. in there from pic – I'll even do pictures, for, especially for stage. To remind myself of blocking, I'll do – I become a stick character. Oh, all right. My character, yeah, yeah. And I'll do, mm -hmm. I'll do certain little pictures of the stick person to, to mimic maybe standing or not so much standing – certain specific unique maybe movements that I have to remember or, or I think or would be right for, at that moment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll start, I'll read for content, I'll read for subtext, I'll read for uh, for, for uh, outward meaning and inward meaning from, from the character and, and, and I'll make sure I understand the words th that I'll have to speak, that I know what they mean, especially if, if they're historic or, or talking about other countries or places I'm not familiar with, mm -hmm. I'm, I'll familiarize myself with the world of that script. That's a great example of doing the research because 
you know, we hear about actors who do research and people who aren't actors might have a hard time understanding like, well, what does that, what does that really mean? You know, it's like, um, and yeah, like just making sure you're pronouncing things the right way and uh, all those examples you gave of just breaking down the script like that uh, really, um, it, it's time consuming. It really is a lot of work. Yeah, that's, Preparation for an actor is is everything, and and I'm sure it is for for directing, for uh, s- the cinematography. Has, uh, each facet of of a production has or should have a certain amount of research that goes behind it for for the individual mm-hmm. to really do the job to the best of the person's ability, mm-hmm. and, and I try to do it. What I, whatever I undertake, I try to do it to the best of my ability. And, you know, YouTube and Google, mm-hmm. the Oxford <laughs> English Dictionary, if it's, you know, something British or Shakespearean. Um, yeah, there's a lot of research. And then if you have to do a dialect, there's a whole, there's a whole different f- facet for me as an actor of, of research and work and, and rehearsal and... Um, I, I just did a, a show with a play, stage play with Prime Stage in uh, the New Hazlitt Theater just in the fall, and we we did uh, the Miracle Worker, which mm. is the story of Helen Keller, mm-hmm. and it, it shows the 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 rela- relationship and dynamic between Helen and her teacher Annie Sullivan, and then how. They both interact with the family, Captain Keller, the father, and Kate Keller, the mom. So it's a family, it's a real family kind of story of, of an incredible young, two, incredible two young ladies and an incredible family mm-hmm. to, to basically nurture and provide Helen what she needed to excel with, with, with great, under great adversity. Mm-hmm. No, she couldn't. From I think age six months or nine months, she couldn't. From that point, due to a disease that she had, she couldn't hear or 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 um, or see. Mm-hmm. She was trapped in a literally in a in a black box. Yeah. And, and how do you get her out of that black box? Well, Annie Sullivan, with with the support of 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 the Keller family, helped helped make that happen. Mm-hmm. So, that's um, um. There's a film adaptation of it as oh, well right. with Patty Duke. Patty Duke and uh, who, by the way, Patty Duke ha- holds the record for shortest Oscar acceptance speech ever. Oh, bless her! <laughs> which is, thank you. <laughs> and it. something uh, wild. I saw that movie adaptation of it, The Miracle Worker, uh, when I was very young. And it really, like, stayed with me until I went to college, and I just thought, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewatch this. I've been thinking about this movie for years, and I rewatched. I'm like, this is a really good movie. (laughs) I was like, this is crazy. And while I was watching it, I found out the next day Patty Duke died. Oh, really? Yeah. It was a, yeah. I really remember Patty Duke from the Patty Duke show growing up. Oh, yeah? Up. I was, grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and yeah. But I, I did see uh, The Miracle Worker with Patty Duke when I was young. Mm. I, I don't remember a lot about it, uh, the, 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 the movie itself, but um, I want to rewatch it. I didn't want to watch it while I was in production for The Miracle Worker. At prime stage, right. because yeah, I didn't want that to, th- their choices to influence mine necessarily. I wanted my, I wanted the sovereign ability to make my own choices without influence of you know something that someone else did. I started to say about uh, doing the the miracle uh, worker, and I was trying to say that at the time we had a dialect coach, and I was yes. trying to work. That was the point I was trying to work 
towards. So mm-hmm. um, it, it, that might make let's, sense. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. It absolutely. might make more sense in hindsight to see. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I was just trying to say that we um, th- th- there's all kinds, as an actor, you know, a lot of times when you have to work on dialect, that's one more facet, one more... Um, one more room you have to step into and include as part of your process as an actor um, is dialect, mm-hmm. especially if it's one you're not familiar with or have never done. But uh, my point earlier, and I sidetracked myself, was that when, when we did the Miracle uh, Worker at Prime Stage last fall, just, just like two months ago, um, we had a dialect coach, uh, 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 Lisa and she was incredible, and she she helped helped us get that, um, that my characters from Alabama. So mm-hmm. there was a deep South kind of vibe, and then Mrs. Keller was originally from Tennessee, so she had a little bit of a mm-hmm. a little bit of a different vibe to it, but still s- Southern. But uh, Lisa helped us, so it, it, it's nice when you have as an actor collaboration with with experts that help enhance your performance so absolutely i think that's so valuable too um i'm originally from texas and so uh knowing when people take the time and consideration to realize that there is more than one type of southern accent and that it can add a richness to what's going on uh you know is a really um it's just really near and dear to my heart personally so. and sometimes the audience doesn't see all that goes into and i'm talking about acting all that the actor goes through and what we how much input from costume makeup hair mm-hmm. dialect coaches f- physical training you know to, to to you know our direction our blocking our movement you know we get a lot of help along the way that and we rely on those professionals, and we thank them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Collaboration. Absolutely. Collaboration. Got to do it. I want to take some time to talk about The Painted, which is a feature film that you are in, the and there's a link to it in the description below, gentle viewer, so don't forget to check that out. I'll remind you again later. But The Painted is a feature film that takes place uh, or is, is uh, it's a production that was set in Pittsburgh. Um, why don't you tell us a bit about your experience with that? Yeah, that's uh, that's D'Ambro Productions, uh, Lou D'Ambrosio. Um, it was written by Lou, uh, directed by Lou, uh, I believe edited by Lou, and um, starring Lou. He's in the primary character. And uh, I had... Met Lou through some through another individual. Uh, I had done a uh, small part on a, a Pittsburgh film, uh, The Great Goddess, and I just had a very small part one one line, one word. I think I say okay, that's my line. But on that set, I met um, Alex, and Alex um, plays the female lead in the painted. Uh, plays uh, Lou's character's wife in the in the painted, and Alex, um, when they were putting the production together, uh, and they were looking to cast uh, someone to play m- my character, Alex said, "Well, I met this guy Rick in on the Greek Goddess set, um, and they wanted wanted to me to meet Lou, so they called me in, and I sat down at a coffee shop, and we I, I met Lou and Alex, and the three of us talked and. I had, in advance of, of that meeting, uh, Lou provided me the script. I read it. I, I really liked it. I liked the character that he asked me to play. I liked the, the plot, and I loved how he wrote. Um, in, in his sc- scripts, he's a lot of narrative that is, f- is really for everyone involved, from the actors to the, the production staff, to, to understand where he's coming from with, with, with all aspects of the, of the, what will be filmed. So I said, Lou, I, I love how you write. I, I love your narration and how much you give to the, 
the the actors in the in the script, and I'd love to do it. So um, he said, "Well, if, Rick, if you want to, you're in," and s signed a contract, and I was ready to go. And and, and I think with the painted, there are a few things that really stick out for me. But the scene uh, scenes that I had with the young man who played my son, uh, he. He just, he was hitting home runs. He really was. He was, he, he, I don't think he had much experience uh, or training as an actor, but boy, when he stepped in, he just nailed it. He was just natural. And you have to watch it. If you watch it, you'll see what I mean. That he, I, I thought he was incredible. And, uh, oh, the, the other thing that I really think is unique about and I'm not going to give too much away because you have the link mm -hmm. in, in your bio or, so everybody can watch it if they want. But uh, Lou D'Ambrosio, the, the superstar, Lou uh, sings the opening song that that in, introduces my character. Mm. And uh, I don't think I knew for maybe two years after the film was released that Lou actually wrote and performed that song. It's so stylized that it sounds like it's a film from the past, like maybe mm. from the 50s or 60s when, when you when you listen to it and pay attention to it. And as a matter of fact, I had someone who w watched the film at some point, or I think it was one of the scenes that I used for, for a real uh, actors use those to get work. Um saw my reel and said, Rick, that song, I, I, I really like that song. We may want to use that in a film. And I put them in touch with, with Lou. I think it was for some other project than what I was auditioning for, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that panned out. I never asked Lou, but, but yeah, it's, he's very, he's very musical and he's a great performer. Very cool. Yeah. A lot of the time, and we talked about this with editing of things changing a lot, when you got the script for it, um, did the did the film change appreciably from the script that you were given to the end result? Uh, I think Lou had the habit of sticking to his script in general, unless there was a a bump in the road based on you know when we get to set or you know. The background or whatnot, he he was very open to changing things or listening to, you know, uh, a reason to change things. He was very supportive of of the actors. He was also acting in it as well, so I think he, you know, it was his it was his it was his creation mm -hmm. from script to to filming. But there there was in, what was, was interesting was. Um, Without spoiling the plot, my character goes to the hospital, and I'm in a hospital bed. And Lou's character comes in to question me about things that are happening in the, the movie, the plot. And another character comes in and is going to question me as well. Well, the character playing, uh, the actor playing the other character um, had a health issue right as we're about to, to film. Mm which caused him to have to go to the hospital. And he, he ended up being okay, but um, it changed the dynamic. Instead of having three characters in a scene, now there's only two of them available. And we only had that location for that day. And based on you know, the, the schedule Lou had, we had, to do, we had to shoot that scene. We couldn't go back and do it. He didn't have the opportunity for that. So he, Lou and I sat down, and he basically shuffled <laughs> the lines to, in a way, and, and reshaped the dialogue in a way that it kept all the information that had to be part of that scene to propel the plot, kept it all in, but allowed it to unfold in a conversation between his character and mine and not that third character's input. So it had to happen. On set, it had to happen pretty quickly, and Lou w was a champ. He he did it. 
mm-hmm. and we pulled off the scene. And I think if you watch the the movie, that scene when my character's in the hospital bed, uh, you hopefully won't. I don't think you will be aware that it's missing an original character that should should have also been in that scene. Mm. Yeah, problem solving is a big part of filmmaking, and it's always exciting to hear how people deal with the hurdles. I'm very happy to hear that uh, the um, other person who was originally going to be in the scene ended up being all right. Which yeah, is he, what you yeah, that's uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, that was scary for him and for us. Mm-hmm. I think um, you know that people say plans do not survive contact with the enemy, and there's a lot of enemy in the world of filmmaking i guess yeah. a lot of things that don't want your movie i think well. the enemy's murphy isn't it murphy's law or something <laughs> yes exactly everything that can, enemy is murphy. murphy murphy is your enemy. everything That's that can go wrong <laughs> murphy will make sure it goes mm-hmm. wrong but that film the painted is in the description of uh this video everybody so uh if you're so inclined go ahead and check that out and um i want to you, you oh, see a lot of Pittsburgh folks, so it's oh, it'll yeah. be fun to watch. Mm-hmm. And uh, most people. Stephanie Swift in her previous episode with us talked about the film. Oh, yeah. And as she well. has she has a scene. Whoa. <laughs> she plays a a badass, wicked character. That's my wife, Stephanie Swift. Mm-hmm. She's she's just acting in the in the in the film, but it scares me even. Mm-hmm. Um, what you you'll see if you watch it, but. I have to shout out my wife, Stephanie. She's of course. Uh, a great actress, a, a great partner, my my best friend, my soulmate, and um, she's getting into directing a lot. I mean, she's studied it in college, but now she's actually going to apply mm-hmm. her knowledge and skill. So. Which is great to hear that she's uh, been continuing with that because when she came on this show, she was talking about her directorial debut, which was... Uh, for a short film that was in the horror sci-fi Pittsburgh 48-hour film project and with 3BT Productions, and you were in that. Right, I do a That's cameo cool. in that mm-hmm. film, and I think she got a nomination. I th- She think co-directed it, and right. I, th- I believe she got a nomination mm-hmm. for... I think best director. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't even I y'all's think. first experience with the 48 because you both were in a 48-hour uh, film project Um short that was in i believe it won in cleveland Is yeah we were right? part of a team uh spearheaded by uh, jay williams and uh, called uh, the f- film was called um i'm blanking on the on the film um it's like uh, it's a sci-fi. Yeah, it's a sci-fi. I, I wasn't sure how to pronounce and it and it's like liminent uh, or something lingerithm. Lingerithm. Oh, that's sorry it. jay i don't know <laughs> I'm getting old. That's all right. But I blank. Yeah, linger rhythm, and we uh, we won the Cleveland mm-hmm. 48 Hour Film Festival Best Film, and we got six other awards. Oh, that's wonderful. Beyond that, one was Best Stunt. And yes, that's a stunt. <laughs> it's a stand that's Stephanie and I film. who get to play husband and wife. Kind of, sort of, a little. Uh, yeah, bit. it's hard. <laughs> you got to watch it, and I think we. You could probably. Include I can, that link yeah, if you want. Yeah, there's a link to that as well. So yeah, so you get to watch it. If you're feeling it. more like a short film or just an appetizer before the entree, yeah, you can uh, check that out. An award-winning too. short film. It mm-hmm. went on to f- film Pal- uh, Palooza. Mm-hmm. I know. That's how DC. I found out about it because I was with the Pittsburgh team at Film Palooza, and we're watching, and we say Cleveland, and then we see you and Stephanie <laughs> up there, and we're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you see Rick's <laughs> ugly mug up there. You can't miss yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> it was so fun. It was like, oh, hey, we know those guys. <laughs> you know, so but I think we we got nominated down there, too, for Best Stunt. I think it was in um, it was 2019. No, no, the, that was... Um, yeah, 20? it was the 2019 Four Day, but it was, it was in 2020. It was right before <laughs> lockdown happened. Was it? Okay, yeah. yeah I, I forget the dates. I got dates, back but... to America from Rotterdam like the week before everything happened. Yeah. <laughs> so that was uh I, I was at a time. I was at a read through f- at a table f- 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 uh at a read through f- for American Rust. Oh, really? With Jeff Daniels and Mar Tierney and Bill Camp and cool. the whole 
there, there was a table with 60 of us because I was one of the recurring characters. And we're sitting at that table. And, and David Levine, uh, the director of entertainment and television for Showtime, was on a speaker in the middle of the table talking to us and welcoming uh, his cast and telling us how excited he was. And he got the cast that he wanted and they were pumped up. But we have to go on hold for two weeks because of COVID. This was March 12th, mm-hmm. I believe, of 2020. Mm. And well, that two weeks turned into one whole year. Yeah. That we were on hold t- until we f- filmed that fall uh, a year, one year later. Wow. So. That's amazing that, um, the, like, you were, um, I was glad that the year later the project still oh yeah well, I, you know because a lot of things just got dropped yeah just kaput you know yeah. but it yeah. really says something about the drive and passion and vision behind that project that they kept it together for that i think that's wonderful oh yeah it was amazing because that's that's one of those things I've i've heard so many horror stories from people where and I have a couple of my own <laughs> where it was, Oh, all this cool stuff was going to happen and then just got destroyed, yeah. you know, and it's, uh, it's rough. Bosch got but, put to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to ask you uh, a little bit more on some stuff here, which is, uh, and it, it kind of goes a little bit with one of the first questions I asked you, which is what's your favorite moment of anything you do. But, um, and you can take this whichever way you want it to be, uh, but whether it's film or theater or, uh, you know, like a specific genre or a character type, whether it's villains or heroes or something else, is there a type of character, a type of performance that is um, at least one of your favorite uh you know ways to embody this craft like what's what's one of your favorite types of characters yeah. to do uh, that's that's a, a super great question um for me i i, I want to play something as an actor i want to play something that's new i want to i want to play a character that is unique that that you haven't seen before in a scenario and in a world, a circumstance that you haven't seen necessarily before. Something that I can literally immerse myself in and, and, and create a character literally from scratch that I don't have a lot of, of automatic directions to go to, to, to create that character that, mm-hmm. I, that I have to be creative in creating the character that I can't just do the, my rubber stamp approach. Uh, so I want, I want it to be, um, a, a degree of difficulty. That's, that's high that, that pushes me and to, to my boundaries and, and that I really have to immerse myself in, uh, maybe not only immersing myself, uh, emotionally and internally, but also maybe f- physically, and um, from from the from the outside in and, and from the inside out, that I have to create, and uh, maybe into directions that that I haven't gone in in the past. Um, what that is exactly, I don't know. Do you? <laughs> if you do, we're going to talk <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes the role finds you. Yeah, so. exactly. Well, I've uh, had a wonderful time speaking oh, with you, you about the craft, uh, your uh, memories and musings and meditations and experiences. And uh, it's been, um, it, I always love talking with people about, you know, these uh, things that are wrapped up in the arts. And, uh, I, um, 
I look forward to seeing like the the more of the things that you continue to do and Stephanie and um, but thank you so much for being my guest here on the Studio Me cast. So, my, my great pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. All right, everybody. So thanks again for joining us for an episode here in <laughs> Studio Me Speakeasy. And if you want to start your own podcast at some point, well, you can come on down here for a free tour, or you can just go to our website at Studio Do Me. It. Do it. Me. <laughs> just do it. Subscribe if you're that kind of person, and we hope to see you next time because we'll be here. Bye-bye. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you want to start your own podcast, why wait? Reach out to us at studioMe.me, and I hope you hear me again soon.